Ho, 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 ho. Hi. Hey. Welcome to The Art of Story, where we take a movie, break it down, and we look at the story structure, character, and themes. My name is Adam Argo, and today I'm joined by Todd Lindsley. How you doing, man? I'm well. How are you doing, Adam? Good. I thought your screen was frozen for a second. Yeah, no, I was just, uh, I was doing my little trick where I can move my eyeballs independent of each other. Oh, that's creepy. There's no, there's no audio effects on that one. I am my own special effect. <laughs> I'm coming out with a filter story. later. <laughs> the Lindsley filter. The uh, Todd, why don't, What's up? Uh, why don't you remind the uh, Why don't you remind the audience where they can uh, get in contact with you and uh, check out some of your stuff? Well, my name is Todd Lindsley, and my website is Todd is Funny. Mainly, it's uh, for comedy writing, but I also do story consulting and um, analysis, coverage, development notes, that kind of thing. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. And Todd, once again, is my favorite person to brainstorm stories with and uh he's in my brain trust he's brilliant he's dynamic he's creative and he always gets me thinking in like i'll i'll start going down this one direction and he'll throw me in a different direction that it always seems to open up a million doors for me so okay whenever uh, you talk to, whenever you say brain trust i'm like i'm like i just want to like welcome to the brain trust <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. anyway yeah. <laughs> so join Todd's cult. That'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're the, the Argonians. The Argonians. The Argonians. There you go. <laughs> we're the Argonians. Like, dude. Anyway. The Argonauts. Argonauts. There we go. Hey, ooh. Ooh, the Argonauts. Yeah. Anyway. I like that a lot. I want to be an Argonaut. I want to fight skeletons and stop motion. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um so real quick with the audience, I want to invite you to check out Story by Numbers. It's uh, the book on story structure. Uh, my book is currently out. Uh, the best way to find it is go to cinematicore.com and follow the links there. Um, there is the old version. A lot of times if you just look it up on Amazon, it'll take you to the old version, which is redacted. Do not buy that book. Uh, it's there because Amazon won't let you unpublish it. Um, but buy the one that is Story by Numbers, uh, Adam Argo. And the best way to find that is through cinematicore.com. Um, and then also uh, on the website, uh, I've opened up my uh, wait list for uh, consultations. Uh, that's for story consultations and uh, script feedback. So um, so if you have an idea that you want to develop into, into a script, uh, but you haven't quite, uh, you're kind of at the outline phase, or you just have like the germ of an idea that you want to develop, uh, then we'll set up some uh, set up a session or maybe a couple of sessions depending on uh, what you want to accomplish and we'll go through the story development process specifically on your story and that is of course uh, your property that is uh, f for me to help you develop your ideas and you'll retain of course full copyright on that um, and then um, and then also the the uh, screenplay feedback or a screenplay consultation uh, where I'll read your scripts and uh, run it through the entire uh, development process, the feedback, the notes, uh, what I think is working, what I think is not working. And then we do a detailed uh, sit down where we uh, online, uh, you know, through Zoom, and we do a breakdown of your scripts and uh, uh, kind of get it to a place where it's ready to present. Um, so check that out. That's at cinem cinematicore.com and uh, you can sign up for the wait list on that. Uh, so today, I am very excited. Today, we're going to be doing the movie Whiplash. This book is for you. Story by Numbers is a step-by-step -step process. It gives you the tools to construct a plot that fleshes out your story with characters so real, so compelling, so multidimensional, you begin to wonder if you're possessed. Story by Numbers is composed of three parts. Part 1 gives you an overview of the 4-act structure, 24 plot points, 8 sequences. Part 2 is a 35-question examination of your story that will guide you through developing and outlining your novel or screenplay into the 4-act template. Part 3, well, that's just next level dope shit. Everyone knows there are no rules for writing a great story. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, here are the rules. Story by numbers. Write more, better, faster, doper.
today I am very excited. Today we're going to be doing the movie Whiplash. Yeah. Uh, this was Todd's suggestion, and I got to say this is this was my first time watching it. I hadn't watched it uh, until uh, Todd suggested it uh, just a few weeks ago. And I can't wait to dive into it. Todd, do you want to give us a, an introduction to the movie? Sure. Actually, when we talked to the last time I was I was on the podcast, we had talked about Dune and and it's thick yeah. soup is what we call it in the comedy. Um, it's it, 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 there's so much to it, and I had talked about how my sensibility had a tendency to move a little bit more towards the um, commercial um, and to pop culture and that kind of thing, and I I like these kinds of stories, but uh, let's, let's go a promising young drummer enrolls at a cutthroat music conservatory where his dreams of greatness are mentored by an instructor who will stop at nothing to realize a student's potential. That's awful. It's interesting. Let's, that, that log line, the, the verb in that log line are mentored. Yeah. Like it doesn't even come close to getting the, the, the drama. And that, that's one thing we want to yeah. keep in mind when with log lines and plots, it doesn't actually describe the plot of the story. Um, but it, yeah. but it, you know, it, it's kind of, again, this is the, the IMDB log line issue. Our mentored, uh, we, we could phrase that a lot better. It doesn't reflect the incredibly compelling story we're about to talk about. Yeah. But, sorry. Go ahead. So tell us oh, more about oh, it. Oh, that's great. Damien um, Chazelle was the uh, director and writer so we've got a little bit of an Artur here. Mm -hmm. uh, Miles Teller was our our uh, top billing. J.K. Simmons, who won a support, best supporting Oscar uh, yeah. for for the role, and uh, Melissa Benoist, Supergirl. I don't know if you knew, ever familiar with Supergirl. She was also in one of my favorite shows. I mean, it, it kind of uh, jumped all of the sharks. Uh, by the time she was on it, but Glee, she was also on Glee. Oh, she was on Glee. Yeah, she was what on. Season? That girl got pipes. She can sing. Really? Yeah, yeah. Was she in the first season of Glee? No, no, no. I like I said, she, they, it, it jumped quite a few sharks before it got to her. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the first couple seasons, I was I was a bit of a Glee. I, I dug it. Oh, I, I didn't think it. I would. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I really like it. Well, it's funny because the the two shows I remember watching during that time were the two shows that I thought I'm not going to be interested. But it was Friday Night Lights and Glee. Those two movies were the and they oh, yeah. two shows. They were just like the best. I just love oh, Friday them. Night Lights is amazing. Oh, forget it. Yeah, I mean, brilliant, yeah. brilliant stuff. Well, the release date was October 15th of 2014, so we've got a, a few years behind us on this one. The box office was. This is notable, by the way. The uh, three point three million. That's Blumhouse. You know, Blumhouse. They, that's their model is to spend very little. Um, and so we should talk about that. Blumhouse is usually does horror movies. Yeah, yeah. And the kind of on you know lean sort of low budget horror movies, but still you know usually high concept. But they they do it really well. They produce yeah. oh, really that's great. great movies. Yeah. So it's interesting that they're kind of, I mean, this feels almost like a, like maybe an A24 or, or something where it's, yeah. you know, it's on the art house side and Blumhouse you don't usually think of as an art house, but. Well, yeah, you don't think of them as prestige. You think of them mm -hmm. as, as, as more, you know, popcorn films. You know, mm -hmm. they did, they did uh, all the, uh, uh, what is it? The, the, the haunted, the found footage haunted movie. The Conjuring. Right? Oh, Come Paranormal on. Activity. Paranormal Activity, yeah, all that stuff. Is that Blumhouse? Isn't it? I thought that was their oh, whole series. Was I thought that's what they built built themselves on was uh, the Paranormal Activity ones. I mean, you can cut all this, but I, I'm, I was pretty sure that's what it was. Anyways, Blumhouse, is, uh, their, their business model is generally... Uh, to not put a whole no, lot of money on the front end. Sorry, Paranormal Activity is uh, Paramount Pictures. But Blumhouse didn't produce it? Oh, no, I'm wrong. That was distribution. Yeah. Yeah, Blumhouse. You're right. You're right. Paranormal Activity. Ah, there you go. Blumhouse. Okay. I should know that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well done. So, so uh, Wait, I'm sorry. Can we go back to budget or box office for a second? Yeah, absolutely. 3.3 well, we million. 
Uh-huh. Three million is a very conservative. That's a very, very, small. very small budget. That's in the budget. When I look at a but script, opening I weekend, say, oh, you know, five five million. That's usually my minimum. Yeah, right so, so opening weekend, yeah, one hundred thirty five thousand. Not even yeah. one million dollars. Yeah, and then it grossed thirteen million dollars. So it like domestically, so it it. Wow, it, it quadrupled its own budget just in the box office, and then worldwide and internationally, it ended up doing fifty million. Which is, it's yeah. not those, those aren't huge numbers, but for what they put into it, man, that paid off. That's yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah no, uh, um, that means Damien's working a lot. You know, yeah, you can- and he is. Yeah, he's very successful. Well, and what's interesting is we also wrote uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane. Oh, yeah. Which when I saw the 10 Cloverfield Lane, I was so mad because I had a script that was very similar ah. structure. It was a, a contained, you know, one location script about isolation that had this big twist at the end. Um, and 10 Cloverfield Lane, you know, John Goodman's amazing. Oh. The, the, whole, the whole cast is really, really, it's a, it's a fun it's a fun thing, and then the fact that they tied that into Cloverfield, I thought it was a lot of fun stuff. I, I like the the um, J.J. Abrams kind of universe stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the the um, my son would call it, "Oh, it's a bottle episode, Dad." I'm like, "Well, it's a movie." He's like, "Yeah, but it's it's a bottle episode." <laughs> That's funny. That's great. Like, it's so a, cute. Yeah, but yeah, no. I mean, television they call it a bottle episode. Um, yeah. But. Uh, yeah, no, I, the thing that was about what was interesting about Whiplash to me was this could have been a, a bottle episode in a lot of ways. I mean, there's very little shot um, outside of a couple different sets. That was like it. Maybe a few locations. That's that was it. And uh, it was. Yeah, they did a really, they, a really clever thing where like the first all the way up to the impetus there. It's everything's in blue. I think it might even be the same. Uh, studio practice room, uh huh. But it doesn't matter because they shot everything blue. And then when he, once he goes into the um, the Work ensemble, space. yeah, the, when he actually goes into the ensemble, everything turns warm, like real Super warm. warm. And it, it's a clever way of using s- like very limited sets, mm-hmm. but really conveying progress. That was anyway. one of the things I loved about this movie, um, and it actually. Like I, we can talk about this further as far as the art direction is concerned, but it reminded me very much of uh, a movie I'd seen a few years back called Shop Girl. Um, seemed to be shot very similarly. Mm. Uh, Steve Martin wrote, or yeah, Steve Steve Martin wrote wrote Shop Girl, the short story, and then adapted it as a as a movie. But the director mm. talked about how he used um, a progression of color throughout the entire thing. It was a, another small movie. But it mm-hmm. just it was so warm and so – and I loved the almost candy-like colors in some of the uh, – in this whiplash. It was just incredible. It felt like yeah, they, they, they really They really controlled the colors in a very mm-hmm. s- simple – the thing I loved the most about this movie was they, they kept – it was a simple execution of very complex ideas. Yeah, and it, it to me it showed the, the sophistication was in its restraint. Mm-hmm. You know, it was in like it, it was really just setting up the scene to really let these characters go at each other. Right, and it's a it's a really it's great that it was structured and executed in such a simple way, and still is incredibly compelling. Everything served the story. And it was, uh, I, yeah, I was super impressed with this movie. I, I hadn't seen it. It got a lot of hype uh, when it came out. And sometimes hype turns me off because I feel like it, it. Yeah. I love seeing a movie before I hear anything about it. But if I hear too much about it, I almost want to get a distance from it. Mm-hmm. I, I did that with Moonlight. I was hearing so much hype that it was this amazing film. And so I, I waited a while to watch it. And then when I finally did watch it, it was out of the context of the, the cultural hype and the conversation. Right. And I just got to experience it for its own art form and absolutely loved it. Like, it, yeah, I was really impressed with Moonlight. And then, um, yeah, and this was this was another movie that I felt was very similar to that, where it had that kind of 
restraint, but sophistication. It, you, it, it didn't do anything, I would say, that was like innovative or too experimental, but everything it did, it executed flawlessly. This is another movie where I wouldn't make too many changes to anything. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll get into that. I don't, I don't want to spoil too much. Yeah, no, but, I, um, I loved, I, I loved all the decisions they made. I, um, this is, this is one of those movies that's very high on my list of, um, screenwriters go watch this, mm. uh, this and, uh, you know, Tootsie, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it, definitely. It, yeah. Just incredible. Work. Cool. So what, what kind of uh, reception did it get critically and with audience on tomato, on the tomato meter? On the tomato meter, uh, it's uh, 94% fresh. Uh, the audience wow. score also shows a 94% as well. So they're both Whoa. agreeing on this one. Uh, the primary critique or um, response was uh, that it was intense, inspiring, and well acted. Whiplash is a brilliant sophomore effort from the director, Damien Chazelle. You know, I've, I've yeah. actually seen it agree when they get low and it's kind of rotten, but yeah. oof. Um, the, the primary critique said that uh, it was intense, inspiring, and well-acted. Uh, Whiplash is a brilliant yeah. sophomore effort from the director and a riveting vehicle for stars J.K. Simmons and Miles Teller. Which, man, Miles Teller. Yeah. He, he just... Um, He's. I mean, he. I've always thought he was someone to watch, but man, with with, with Whiplash, uh, he really brought some in, interesting things to it, which was, it, I think, is kind of difficult for for. Uh, I don't want. Uh, he's not a child actor, but I think of him as a child actor. Well, the thing that is, he's playing a nineteen-year-old kid yeah. who is virtuoso. Like he, he's a. Yeah. He's a. He's a. You know, he's playing a kid who is a genius at a very difficult skill. Mm. And the thing that I loved about Teller's performance was it like it did get all the intensity and the and, and the the struggle, but it also got the naivety, like na- naivete. <laughs> I always say that word weird. Um, it, it has his naivete, his immaturity, the the awkwardness, the uh, his difficulty with eye contact. Yeah. All of those things played well. Like the whole time I'm watching it, like I was embarrassed for him, like all the dating scenes. You're uh, so embarrassed for him. But I'm like, I've I've seen that in other uh, virtuosos that I've known. Yeah. That, you know, I, I admire them. And I'm also like, oh, man, you're uh, you're you're like the immaturity really showed itself. And Teller had this way of capturing that in a very authentic way, which makes me think like maybe he is that for acting, you know, maybe he's a virtuoso for maybe, acting, Yeah, but still managed to convey the, the, like he came off as unself-aware, which is the hardest thing to do as an actor. Like most people, most, a lot of actors, even very experienced actors, you always feel like they're aware of the camera and trying to look good on camera. Mm, and the yeah. greatest actors uh, are the ones who, are so unaware of the camera, but still allow you into their thought process. So when you look in their eyes, you feel like you're reading their mind. It's extremely rare. And both JK Simmons and uh, Teller accomplished that in this movie. They, they have that complete disregard for the camera and yet an intimate uh, relationship with it. Yeah. And that was, I, I honestly, when I was watching him, it reminded me of, uh, and this may be, I, I don't think it's hyperbole, but it kind of reminded me of the very young Robert Redford and watching him and his whole, mm. it was, it was an interesting thing to feel like whiplash felt very much like pulling back into the sixties and seventies where they were trying to get kind of um, that cinema verite kind of feel of the authenticity of the moment. And I really felt um, that they, but both of those actors brought that to this. They just had, you know what, you know who it reminded me of? It it reminded me of a young John Cusack. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Like to me, I was getting major Cusack vibe, which I love. love Maybe that's who I, I, I was trying to place who it was and I kept going back to Robert Redford, but 
I can see Kuzak as well. John, sorry, yeah. there's two Kuzaks. So, well, there's yeah, Joan Kuzak is also uh, amazing. I I wish she had like John Joan Kuzak is- got to play a lot of lead girls, but Joan, uh, she's just so good. She's so charismatic. Uh-huh. She's so funny. She's so clever. But um, yeah, uh, my wife and I were watching uh, Sixteen Candles the other day. Oh, and you saw John Kuzak <laughs> playing one of like the the geeks, the nerds. Oh, and the whole time I'm just like. Uh, no, he's uh, he's uh, he's too cool for that. Like it's it's almost like oh wait wait till wait till he gets to say anything and he gets to play Lloyd. Oh, he's so good. Say anything, say anything yeah. is also on my heavy rotation. When I want to feel nostalgic, say anything is is right there. Yeah, yeah. Naomi Sky. Yeah. Oof, that was such a great. Okay, interest. so uh, let let's tie this in. So we want to uh, before we get too much into analysis and stuff, we we'll, or. Uh, uh, Talking about, well, I guess, anyway, let's jump into structure, shall we? Okay, so first we want to we wanna identify the structure. So our, our way of uh, breaking down a movie is we want to identify the major landmarks in the story structure and then look at how the story structure informs character, how the character reveals theme, and then we discuss uh, how the filmmaker um, kind of put their voice in exploring this. Uh, exploring the script and exploring the structure. So it, a lot of this is about understanding how you build the story and uh, how the execution is just as important as the story itself. There, um, it's, it's a really unique relationship. And one of the things I really advocate is for screenwriters to learn film grammar. Um, and for especially storyboard artists, storyboard artists are trained in film grammar um, but often are not trained in story structure. And then screenwriters learn story structure, but not, they're not often trained in film grammar. And, uh, you know, all of us kind of learn it as we go. And the more movies we watch, the more we learn it. But uh, being someone who has sold scripts, option scripts, worked as a screenwriter and continue to write and also write novels. Um, and then also someone who's made most of my career as a, um, as a storyboard artist, uh, as a director, the relationship between the two is vital, you know, and, and I, I am seeing a lot of directors who do not have training in story um, and they depend on their cinematographers to think for film grammar. And there's kind of that, the, the studio way of uh, executing things. But, um, but what, one of the things I want to advocate with the art of story is that relationship between story structure and film grammar. Um, so because of that, we want to talk about story structure. And the first thing we want to do for story structure is identify the dramatic question. Um, so with uh, Whiplash, the dramatic question is is kind of establishes the spine of the entire uh, show. It's it's the plot. And the plot is defined by what the, the problem the character is trying to solve. So in the case of Whiplash, Todd, what would you say is the dramatic question? Well, like real quick, and on, on IMDb, it says uh, he is mentored. Yeah, which is you know it, it turns them into the, to, to the object, not the subject. But what what is the dramatic question? What is who is the protagonist, and what will they achieve? Well, they set out to. Yeah, uh, is it Neiman or Nyman? I don't remember. I uh, call him Andrew. Who Andrew? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where, Andrew and Fletcher. Huh? Andrew and Fletcher. Oh, Fletcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. um, Fletcher always called him. By his last name, so I just you know. Um, so uh, will Andrew play for Fletcher Studio uh, Band? Oh, that's good. That's interesting. Because um, that's what made me feel like the third act was so much more meaningful Mm -hmm. because not only well anyways but yeah that's my that that's what i posit as the the um the the dramatic question that's a really good one and the reason why i like that is because it's very concrete it's very like yeah did he or did he not yeah i went something that is a little more tied into what I do think he's setting out to do, which is 
Uh, th- this is what I pose, and we can talk about the difference between the two. The, the dramatic question I came up with is, will Andrew convince Fletcher he is a great drummer? He's a great, yeah. I feel like yeah, that a is a drummer. layer in the story, but I feel like the dramatic question is, will he or won't he play for him? Because the thing of it is, is he does play in his band. He does become sure. core. Yeah, and he played core early yeah, on in the movie. Out. He came in, he came out. No, it was never. So, was he so really technically, he answered that he answered that question. And in Fletcher's band, you're never in or out. You are. You play in it once, then you're out the next. The final, which is the part final of his power. will tell you whether or not he was in or out. That's the thing. It's like even See, what I and what I band, would argue. Go ahead. Even if he was playing with the band, he's never in. Like it wasn't until the last. But with Fletcher, you're never in. Ever like you can impress him one minute, the the next minute he hates your guts and he's kicking you out. And I think I so, th- I think and I think that the, the the thing he's setting out to do is to to earn his respect. To his conscious desire is I'm going to prove to this guy that I am Charlie Parker. I'm the next bird. Oh, man. And this guy is Joe Jones. Like they're casting themselves in this role. Yeah. And I'm going to prove to Fletcher that I'm the bird. I'm the new Charlie Parker. I mean, that's a and good dramatic question. That's what would prove to Fletcher that I am the next Charlie Parker. Because yeah, every that. single strategy he has, it's not just that he wants to play in his band. It's that he wants to prove to Fletcher that he that he is that. Which sounds a lot like unconscious drive, but in this case, it is very deliberate and very mm-hmm. conscious. The unconscious drive is, uh, you usually have to mine for that. And in this one, we have to mine just a little bit. But it is about a very driven person. And very driven people, they tend to wear their unconscious drives on their sleeves a little bit. Right. Um, so let's let's jump into the dramatic question of uh, will he prove that he's a great drummer? And I want to talk about what what makes something great uh, once we kind of get through the structure and stuff. Um, but what what is the moment where we where we cross where we finish the first act? We've posed the dramatic question, and he sets out to achieve that goal. So the first act is all about you present the problem with the impetus Mm -hmm. and then they, they, the, um, they don't ask the dramatic question until they take the first steps to achieve that goal. Um, What, what what is the moment of that? Where do we cross into the second moment? The, the first culmination, uh, would for me be, uh, the moment at which he is invited to, to stay to sit in as an alternate. Okay, that's very interesting. Why do you think that that is the pose of the dramatic question? Because he's in the game. He's now in the game. Like as an alternate, as a even as a core, it doesn't matter. He's not in the game yet. He's not. See, my thing is, is when I ask that dramatic question, what I'm asking is, is. Um, He's a guy who doesn't take people permanently. I think I once know. once uh, he has that final scene, by the way, spoilers, um, once he has that final scene, um, I don't I think he's gonna start the next band or the next phase of whatever he does next. He's gonna go, okay, uh, Andrew, uh, I need a trombone. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's, he's from this point on um, because he has proven himself as his drummer. Will he be his drummer? Yeah. Cause he is considered to be the greatest of the instructors, uh, the greatest of the mentors, the greatest of, you know, and mm-hmm. so, yeah. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between impetus and dramatic question. Okay. Um, because it is something that's uh, come up in a few different podcasts as well. And um, the, the main difference is the impetus is when the, the opportunity or the threat is presented. Now, it doesn't mean that the protagonist is going to engage in that opportunity or threat. Mm-hmm. And so it's not until they take their first steps 
when when they leave to take the first steps, they're they're ending, and that usually represents, like you said, the first culmination, according to Frank Danielle, and the uh, and uh, the end of Act One usually, uh, and again, it, this this prototypically, um, and I do think that this movie actually has a a, a very prototypical story structure. It, it kind of lands at all the right points, but the way it conveys that is a little bit unconventional. It plays with the constraints very, very well. Um, so I would argue that what you're describing is the impetus because he says, okay, you can come into my band. You're just an alternate. An alternate is like, okay, you can be a part of the band, but you're not going to, I'm not going to decide to respect you. And that's why like the dramatic question is, is he a great drummer? A great drummer is somebody who is his core drummer. And uh, so he has to earn his respect. He has to earn his place. And I would say the moment where he sets out, not just to be in his band, but to prove that he is a great drummer, that he is a Charlie Parker level drummer is the moment where he takes him out in the hall and he says, you're here for a reason. And he goes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. He's like, you belong here. You believe that, don't you? And he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, I want to hear you say it, say the words. And then Teller says, I'm here for a reason. And it's like, you can see him just building them up. And that's the moment that he's like, oh, I'm not just here to turn pages. I'm not just here to fill in in case the main guy gets sick. I'm one of his chosen. I'm one of his elect. I, so from that moment on, it cuts to a shot, a slow motion shot of him walking through the door back into the practice room. Oh and yeah, that is the cross in that's crossing the threshold into nice. the second act. Nice From visual. That moment there, on, yeah. yeah, it's it's great. It's 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 subtle, dramatic, and that moment he walks in owning the place. He's like, I belong here. And then the first thing he does is rips that. Like uh, J.K. Simmons is the epitome of what I mean by the moral imperative. He is a const. He says, "This is my room. This is my sphere." These are my rules. These are my moral rules of survival. If you want to survive here, you have to face these forces of antagonism. J.K. Simmons' character, Fletcher, is the embodiment of a moral imperative, the mm -hmm. forces of antagonism. Um, so that, that happens 24 minutes in. So oh, that's okay, yeah. normally the first act is about 30 minutes in on a prototypical, you know, uh, hour and a half to two hour movie, 90 minute to two hour movie. Um, so 24 minutes, uh, that's, that's short. Um, but it's, it's really well paced. This movie is beautifully paced. Like yeah. it, it allows you to engage in the music without, I don't feel wasting any time at all. There's, there's, it is beautifully edited, really tightly edited. Um, so then we go from the dramatic question to the climax and the climax is the answer to the dramatic question. And if we go with the idea that the dramatic question is, will Andrew convince Fletcher he is a great jump drummer? And I'm, I'm saying great in quotes on purpose. Uh, wh what is the answer to that question? What is the climax? Is it a yes or a no? It's a yes. Why? Uh, why, why is it a yes? What, well, what, because what they, happens they did it so, so well, like visually again. Um, because the father was always kind of an element of doubt. Oh, now, that's interesting. And when his father, you know, who, every father, I'm a father. Um, and the reason why they have doubt is because they love and they want, they want uh, your child to have both comfort and safety and certainty. Those are all things that a parent wants for your child. Um, and... Mm -hmm. Andrew is not choosing the easy path. He is not choosing um, mediocrity. He made that very clear about the middle middle of the film. He's yeah. not choosing to be a Division three player. Yeah. Um, he's and the, what's brilliant about what they did is I got to see Paul Reiser lose his doubt. You know what I mean? It was like he went. Mm. There was this. When was that? composition where Paul Paul was kind of looking oh, at yeah. the stage and he went from this to 
Um, like, what are you doing to my kid to what is my kid doing to you? It was just yeah. a beautiful moment. And, yeah. and I, and at that, cause I remember weeping as I watched it last night, it was the first time I ever had that moment, but I just was like, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul Reiser. Yeah. Just a yeah, beautiful yeah. moment because what he, he just wanted, he wanted, he wanted to take his son and to give him comfort and to, um, help him through this very difficult time, this massive failure, which they did a really good job of setting up. Each scene was like, listen, remember guys, nobody here forgets. Nobody here is ever going to forget what you do on this stage today. Yeah. And so it's brilliant that they keep, they, great they what's that? It's great stakes. Oh, you feel the stakes so all good. the way the through. The are so high all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, so wh- when Paul Reiser um, was like, hey, come on, let's let's just go. And then he's like, and what I loved about it was he was showing the author or the, the screenwriter or the director was showing that, no, 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 this is the moment where I have to choose to be. Am I going to be yeah. great? Yep. Yeah. And he literally is walking away. And he comes back using that um, that kind of uh, blocking to move mm-hmm. to make the character appear small to the screen, and then all of a sudden back in, and then he's surrounded by his his godlike kit throne, whatever, mm-hmm. because yeah. he's like, "Screw you, I am great," and yeah. he had to choose to do that. It was just oh, so many great visual moments, especially in this movie. Yeah, let's let's tie back into structure. Yeah, I totally agree with you. This is why I love this movie so much. Um, so, what is the moment that he that, that I have? Uh, yes, he does. So, will the dramatic question is: Will Andrew convince Fletcher that he is a great drummer? And the answer is yes. By playing so well, Fletcher could no longer deny his greatness. Yeah. Which sounds, it sounds very like, but it is very specific. This is the conversation they're having. Are you a Charlie Parker or are you not? And if you want me to think of you as a Charlie Parker, these are the rules. And uh, what what's the moment that he achieves that goal? There's a really great, uh, and they do it with both dialogue and visually. Yep. Um, where No, this is strictly, well, it's visual and audio. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I cut you off. No, it's okay. Um, uh, it's when he starts. There's like this trill on the drum, and I'm not exactly sure what it is that that I don't. I, I'm not a percussionist. I don't know. But um, uh, he he was doing that one exercise. Remember when he he was like, "How fast can you drum? This is not my yeah. tempo." And all of a sudden, yeah. he's doing it, and even. Fletcher could not deny that he was doing it. Like he went from saying, oh, I guess there's a little bit of avant-garde of the old uh, percussion there tonight. Yeah. Uh, we're just yeah. going to, wow. Throwing him under the freaking bus. Yep. And then basically. Sabotaging him. He deliberately yeah. just sabotaged him. Deliberately. Great. He, he the literally, whole thing was revenge. Yeah. He threw him under a bus and he had to lift that bus up and throw it back at him, basically. Yes, exactly. That's a great metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say the moment, the climax of the movie is literally two shots before the credits. Mm-hmm. It's that Italian shot close up of J.K. Simmons where you can't even see his face. It's Italian. And the, the Italian shot is, you know, that comes from um, uh, once, upon the, once upon a time, Sergio Leone yeah. he invented the Italian shot. And it's, it's, you're just seeing the top of the nose to uh, the top of the brow. Mm-hmm. And it's just this shot. And you're reading, it's one of the most intimate, intense, highest level tension shot where you're right. reading their mind. And J.K. Simmons going from the moment of, you're doing it to you nailed it. Like they, they were enemies at the beginning of the scene. Mm -hmm. And by the end, he's like, Holy shit. You are Charlie Parker. You are the new bird. That was his coronation. And then you cut to miles Teller being like, do I have it? Do I have it? And then it just filled him with this 
yes. And then literally the next shot nails it and then credits. Yeah. So it's, that's, what's so great about this. It's perfectly cut where it, it just, it nails that climax and then goes to credits. It gives you that answer and then lingers on the, wait a minute, is that a good thing? Cause this is really fucked up. It's a great fucked up story. Oh, it's terrible. Um, yeah. So then we go, okay. So we, we've got the spine now dramatic question. Will he convince Fletcher that he is a great drummer? The answer is yes, he does. And that's Italian shot says it all. Um, and then, uh, then we want to identify the presentation, the moment where the pr- opportunity or threat is presented, um, which is called the impetus. Um, and I would say that it, it's the moment where he comes up to him and says, um, be in room B16 at 6 a.m. Mm. So he invites him to join the Schaefer Conservatory studio band. So that is an opportunity. He's not saying you're one of my people. You're not great. Nope. This is an opportunity to say, all right, you're going to play with the big boys and we're going to play rough. You be there at 6 a.m., which I, oh, God, when he woke up late the next morning, I'm like, oh, man, they're not. We've seen that plot point over and over again. And you're like, this is your one opportunity and you're blowing it. And then they show how fucked up it is that he deliberately handed him six six o'clock and he's sitting there three hours later at attention. It's so, and you, that's when you see the full depth of the moment. And so that, that moment comes in at 12 minutes. Like this is so economically done 12 minutes and we're already deep into the stakes. Um, So 12 minutes in impetus, 24 minutes in dramatic question. And then an hour 40, we get into the, uh, we get the climax, the payoff. So that gives us kind of the big, um, the, the spine of it. And from there we want to see kind of the up and then the down. So the next thing we want to look at is midpoint. Um, And the midpoint is kind of where you feel like the, the main character is, or the protagonist is, is making progress toward their goal. They feel like they're uh, in this case, he feels like he's starting to earn their respect, but then the the bottom drops out from underneath him. Um, And there's a major turn. And then after that, all the strategies are reactionary and frantic and they don't have any kind of deliberate strategy. Their old value system isn't quite serving. Um, what is the moment where that turn happens? Where, what's the midpoint of this movie? Well, it's when he, uh, uh, when he's told he's going to play for the, for the festival or not the festival, the, the contest that he's going to be the core player for the, the contest. Why would that be a midpoint? Uh, because it, it appears as though he's me, he's, he's hit his goal. It appears as though, oh, I'm I'm receiving the respect and the and the acknowledgement that I was looking for as far as. Uh, so, what's the emotional trap door that opens beneath him? How does how how is that a reversal? Are you talking about the low point? Like, what's the no the midpoint that point? that he's he's making progress toward achieving his goal, and then all of a sudden the midpoint is introduced, and you're like, oh wait, uh, you're not even close to the goal. You have a lot more to learn before you achieve it. Where does well, it turn when it takes a downward turn? Which is, this is difficult because the whole movie, you never know where you stand. You never know where, where Andrew stands with Fletcher yeah. the whole time. And that, and that's that's kind of like, I'm trying, uh, it's a little muddy right now just because I'm trying to remember um, all of the times that not only did they, um, did he switch between him and the original core player, but then they introduce the other drummer, and the other drummer uh, is ends up Johnny Utah. Johnny Utah, <laughs> man, one hundred percent pure adrenaline. Yeah, uh, um, it's it's the Ryan character, but they keep referring to him as Johnny Utah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'd make a case that the the midpoint uh, is the moment where um, it's not when he learns that he's core; it's when um, Andrew. Uh, is replaced by Ryan. He brings him in. They have him kind of have a drum off and he says, sorry, you're just not good enough. We're going to give it to Ryan. And then he gets that phone call and the text and he goes into the next room and he's like, wait, no, I deserve to be core. I have earned core. You're bringing this guy. That's the first time that he looks at his friend and he says, you're going to choose that shit over me. Mm -hmm. And you start to see kind of the monster that Fletcher's creating. And um, so then uh, 
he goes in the next room and Andrew comes in after him and he says, look, I deserve this. I have earned it. And he goes, if you've earned it, then you would be the core. And he, so then he says, if you want the part, earn it. So the midpoint is that moment where, um, where he walks in and he says, if you want the part, earn it. Yeah. And, and what he's saying is, no, you haven't proven, you haven't proven to me that you've earned it. He thought he earned it. He thought he deserved it. And, uh, Andrew was feeling really confident that he deserved it. He felt he had, he had achieved his goal. And that moment was the moment that said, no, you haven't achieved the goal. I can replace you at any second. Mm -hmm. Even though in Andrew's mind, he's like, I don't understand. I'm a better drummer. I'm showing you that I'm a better drummer. And he's saying, no, you're not, which gets into the subjectivity of judgment of art. But, um, but then he says, if you want to earn it, and then he's like, not now. And we, we find out that, you know, his former student had died, you know, yeah. we, so, in the later scene. Because when he, after he had that scene, he was then given the core player role for Lincoln Center, right? Well, hold on. The interesting thing. Okay. This, the interesting thing is um, right after he says, if you want the part, earn it. The very next scene, he goes to his girlfriend and ends it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, yeah. oh, I'm not. So then you can see he's like all of a sudden saying, oh, I, I'm, I, I need to fully commit to this mm -hmm. and cut out anything that is a distraction, anything that is not 100% drumming. So he, start, he starts to do this kind of radical reactionary uh, strategies that are just like, okay, whatever it takes, I'm going to give everything to Fletcher. Mm -hmm. So he ends things with his girlfriend. And then the next scene is when, um, you know, we find out that the phone call he got was uh, a former student of his died in a car accident. He didn't you know? die in a and car later, accident. And later, yeah, later we learned that he was lying. He actually died of a suicide and he was, uh, Fletcher was implicated uh, as, uh, as being an abusive teacher. Um, so, so the midpoint happens right about 50 minutes in an hour, 40 minute movie. That's kind of right on target. Right. And again, that's why I go back to this, this structure is very simple, but it's, it's not the structure that's complex. It's a really good example of a simple story with incredibly complex characters, which is the stories that really resonate with me. There are some writer directors out there that will get really complex story structures and honestly, they're, they're kind of given, I think they're a little bit overrated because they tend to have such complex story structure that you lose track of the character and you think, right. oh, it was so smart because I couldn't keep up with all the plot contrivances. But in, in my opinion, the really meaty, sophisticated shit usually has fairly simple plot structure, but that simple structure reveals a lot about interesting character dynamics. And this movie is a beautiful example of that. Um, so yeah, I would say the midpoint is if you want it, earn it. And then from there, it's just spiraling. This is where he starts to like, I need to do everything I can to prove to Fletcher, even at the expense of his own well being, which sends us reeling toward the low point. And what would you say the low point is for whiplash? Uh, it's when he, he fails, uh, after the car accident and he, um, he, even it, all of it, no matter what he tried to do, he still could not perform. It just wasn't going to happen. Yeah, no matter what, no matter he was what. not going to get his respect. Yeah, no matter what. Like, literally went through a car accident, and in his brain, he was like, none of that matters Yeah, as much as proving to Fletcher that I am the new Charlie Parker. Yeah, of, of drums. Um, yeah, exactly. I agree. The low point is definitely the car accident. And then after that, it's a dramatic change in structure. Um, so, so that kind of gives us the, the big broad strokes. And then of course we have the hook, uh, the opening scene. Um, and what, what's the hook in, in whiplash? Um, it's, it's almost like this confrontation when he finds out that he's like, I, uh, you're a first year and he's, mm -hmm. He's kind of doing some things that are, you know, interesting with his drums. And I'm not exactly sure if, and I, I kind of gone back and forth trying to figure out, was he, did he, was he supposed to be in the practice room that he was in, or was he specifically placing himself there so that Fletcher could come in and incidentally see him somehow? I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but ultimately there was kind of this confrontation a really interesting 
um, because he was doing some really incredible um, drumming, and it was very obvious to the audience, I think, that there it was a talented person who was doing something they were good at. Yeah. Um, and then he came in and kind of, uh, kind of was like, okay, whatever. You know, it's it's you're you're a kid. You're, um, he he kind of laid it all to, um, to nothing. Yeah. So what I, I totally agree. The, so the the hook is is what I would call the Fletcher and Andrew meet cute. Because it is a like this is a, a story about a very fucked up romance, um, sure. not necessarily in a sexual way, but definitely in this like uh, uh, really it's a relationship story. It is about a relationship and whether they're uh, going to be engaging in this relationship and how they validate each other. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, that the thing I I really enjoy about that movie is the opening shot is uh, it's a wide shot uh, on a dolly and we slowly dolly in to uh, Andrew drumming and it's yeah. it's in the it, it is in the practice rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to Cal Arts and Cal Arts has like a music school as part of it and uh, um, lots of cross pollination and stuff. And so there, there were like the music school had these hallways of like, almost like cells and they're, you know, sound, they're supposed to be soundproofed, but they're more like sound resistant, but he's playing with the door open and, you know, in, in a music, like in a music school, you never go to a practice room and play with the door open usually, yeah. which tells me like, maybe he was trying to lure, uh, who knows? But what's really interesting is the opening shot is that slow crawl in, which yeah. feels like uh, usually a filmmaker will use that kind of crawl as a kind of predator approaching feel. Oh, yeah. And later you realize, oh, that's Fletcher walking in saying, oh, here's my next dinner, like the shark approaching in for uh, his next victim. And it has that really great kind of subtle way. Like later you realize, oh, this is Fletcher's point of view dollying in toward uh, toward well, Andrew. What's kind of fun about the dialogue is that he's like, oh, so you know who I am and you know that I'm looking for people. Yeah. So that's why your door's open? Okay. So you think you're the, you're the predator, but predator is me. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He total power move absolutely yeah and then there's one moment that's really interesting before the visual before the movie like before the visuals kick in there is a bit of a very unique hook do you remember what it was no i don't there was this the screen was complete black and we hear a one drum beat then another then another oh yeah yeah, yeah. slowly okay. it builds up to the moment the where it gets so the- fast and it's like, boom yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was a really clever way because it, it's nothing but the sound of the drum speeding up to the point where it's just like one beat all the way to just pure, uh, uh, I don't know, what would drum rolls, I guess. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not I'm not a musician either, but um, yeah, I, I thought that was such a great way to introduce us to this world and to, to, to show kind of the momentum. Although I don't feel that represented the momentum of the movie. The movie didn't feel that way. The movie felt immediately confrontational and the pacing was like, I I think it's really well paced because there's lots of push and pull and speed up and slow down and uh, deep breaths and holding your breath and all that. Um, Great. So because of that, we've, we've got the dramatic question, climax, impetus, midpoint, low point and hook. And it fits to a very kind of conventional prototypical structure, but does it really well, um, which um, allows us to start to gain insight into the protagonist. Who's the protagonist of this movie? Uh, it's definitely Andrew. Yeah. So we're in Andrew's perspective. We're going through this gauntlet, this ordeal with Andrew. Um, and because of that, we want to dive into his character. Um, and explore his character arc. Okay, uh, so uh, let's dive into the character dimensions. Uh, and the character dimensions we always look at as the inner conflict. Um, yes. And uh, so the reason we call it the inner conflict is because um, 
There's the external conflicts, which are the problems they're trying to solve. The inner conflict is addressing uh, the the conflict between the conscious desire, the unconscious drive, the Achilles heel, and how they're negotiating the moral imperative. It's the way they're internalizing that conflict, which affects their motives, why they care about things, um, and particularly like their their subconscious and psychological makeup that drives their value systems. Uh, so that's that's why it's called the inner conflict. Um, and the first dimension of the inner conflict is the conscious desire, which is this, the problem the protagonist is setting out to uh, achieve. Uh, what is the conscious desire of uh, Whiplash? He wants to be great. He wants to prove that he's great. Yeah, he wants to prove he's great. And it's interesting because usually the unconscious drive is about trying to prove something. But this is about a virtuoso who his whole identity is wrapped up in proving something to people. Uh, so, yeah, pr to prove uh, that Fletcher that he is driven as talented as Charlie Parker. He wants to be seen in that light by making these extreme decisions. Um and then the unconscious drive represents his value system. And what I put is he believes his self-worth comes from being the best in his field. And you see that in that dinner scene where, you know, his cousins are awesome. like, you know, they're like, oh, well, you know, he gets invalidated because, oh, he's at the music school. Isn't that cute? And he's like, well, he's going to be quarterback. You know, his cousin's going to be quarterback and stuff. And then he just shits on him and puts him down. He's like, well, it's the best music school in the world, you know. Um, and he's like, well, I love, I love how he's like, yeah, it's, it's division three, dude. It's yeah. Like, it's division three. What? Yeah. I love that line where he's like, uh, well, why don't you come play football with us sometime? And he's like something you will never hear from the majors. <laughs> the NFL. Oh God. So you said you get a sense of the ego, but you're also like, but that's the thing. That's uh, yeah. It, we'll get into that a little bit about like the relationship between ego and greatness and, uh, and art in particular. Um, so that unconscious drive is his worth comes from this kind of rigid status hierarchy. Um, and that's where he, he gets the, the self-worth from. And then his Achilles heel and the Achilles heel is the uh, kind of the flaw or the false belief or the weakness within the, um, within the value system of the unconscious drive. Um and I put that he believes Fletcher is the ultimate judge of his greatness. So that that's kind of the ground. That's the false belief he's operating from. He has given yeah. Fletcher all of this power by saying, uh, by, by regarding his, him as the ultimate arbiter. Mm -hmm. Fletcher will tell him whether he's great or not. And every single scene he has, he is trying to gain his approval. Right. So, and the moral, moral imperative is a very subversive moral imperative. The moral imperative uh, is the rules of survival within a given sphere. And the moral sphere that Andrew's navigating is Fletcher's practice room. That is the do or die rules of this is how you survive. This is a jungle and you're going to die. If you don't play by these rules, you're going to be um, exiled or excommunicated from it. Um, so his moral imperative, uh, I, I, I articulate it this way. To become worthy of greatness in the eyes of Fletcher, Andrew must persevere despite Fletcher's rejection. That's the big lesson that most people never learn is that. Fletcher is trying to say, go away, leave me alone. But what he wants, he, the great artists are the ones that say that don't take no, they don't take rejection. They say, reject me all you want. I'm going to keep playing until you're undeniably recognize my greatness. And that represents the full arc before. Um, Andrew was trying to say like, uh, uh, Fletcher's going to tell me when I'm great. If I'm core, then I'm great. If I get invited into the ensemble, then I'm great. If he tells me that I've earned it, then I'm great. If he lets me play in this concert, then I'm great. But it's not until uh, Andrew learns that what I really need to do is face the rejection and accept the rejection uh, that he 
determines his value. That's when he gains his respect. And that's, that's what the whole climax is. When he says, no, 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 no. I'm no longer interested. I am great. He takes the ownership Mm -hmm. of the greatness and he says, no, I know I'm great. I'm not in doubt anymore. I know I'm in tune. I know I'm hitting the rhythm. I'm hitting the pace. And he keeps saying, that's not my rhythm. That's not my pace. And when Andrew says, when Andrew says like, no, fuck that. I'm going to lead now. That's the moment where he's like, now we're playing on the same field. And Fletcher, that's the lesson that he doesn't tell anyone that they have to figure out for themselves, which is what makes it so great. Um, mm-hmm. I was seeing that you're kind of like, mm, I was getting some like uh, some skepticism on your face. Is Do you disagree? Uh, no, I, 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 it actually comes into my theory about the, the author uh, himself or their self. Uh, the I have this theory um, that the author probably was raised in a very religious home. Hmm. And uh, 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 I believe uh, when I see movies like this, um, especially Whiplash, uh, it's a testament to overcoming a... Um, uh, almost kind of a fanatical parent. That's um, really interesting. Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. Just because he has such a rigid, like his his religion is jazz. His his mm-hmm. prophets are are yep. Charlie uh, Parker, Stan and, Getz and yeah. Charlie Parker, and Buddy Rich, and Joe Jones. Joe Jones, yeah, all these people who are um just these amazing things. Which, by the way. I personally feel like this movie was such a love letter to jazz in a way that was so organic. Um, I just, uh, all the coloring and everything, it was just, to me, when I I saw, I know I'm getting off subject with the character, Um, but ultimately, uh, yeah, I I feel like um, he was at a certain point trying to gain the approval of his father. And, and that's one of the reasons why I liked it. I liked the duality of the father being on the side of the stage and the, and the father being on in the front of the stage, you know, it's like these two people who, I mean, he dearly loves his father. He spends his free time with his father. Yeah. Um, His father, yeah, he was obviously very close. However, you know, parents aren't perfect. You know, we can want something else for our children than what what our children want. Um, But ultimately, hopefully, they want them to be happy regardless. Mm -hmm. And it was that moment when the father um, on, on the side of the stage was able to go, okay, this is the only way he's going to be happy. This is, this is where it is. This is, that's it. That's all it is for him. And Mm -hmm. finally the other father who was like, I finally found my Parker. I finally found Bert. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's diving into themes, which I want to open that door into. Sure. Um, So, so that moral imperative, uh, definitely Fletcher is the moral imperative. Um, And (laughs) so we do see the journey into the arc, which, uh, gives us the theme and this is what i articulated as a theme which is greatness this is the theme of the of the film the, the central theme the the proposition that it's making which is greatness in art is only achieved when you commit despite all rejection or when you persevere despite all rejection yeah and it's it's that like it's when everybody says, stop doing this. You're not worthy. You are not chosen. You're not good enough. And you still keep doing it. Right. That's when you achieve greatness and not before. You have to face the rejection. And that, that's one thing that's really fascinating about this question. Um, and, and before we before we dive into kind of like what the, the moral question and the big theme question about this I do have kind of a plot question that I want to ask you about and and see what you think. 
So that moment uh, after the car accident, after he meets with the lawyer, he's walking down the street, he passes the JVC jazz um, uh, poster. And on, the, on the transformer on the street, yeah. And then he um, he passes the, what is it, the, the Noel Jazz Club, and he, hear, and he sees Terrence Fletcher playing tonight. And he walks in and, you know, he's playing and, and he's like, oh, you know, Andrew, come here. So that was, do you think that was a setup? Was that a lure that um, was Fletcher deliberately setting that up, trying to lure Andrew in? Or do you think that was legitimately a coincidence? I don't think it was a coincidence. I think he knew that um, Fletcher, like, I remember my audio engineering instructor in college was, uh, uh, he played guitar every Thursday at a uh, coffee shop. I knew he was, he was going to be there. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it was a, I think it was him, uh, Andrew, um, saying, you know what? I, I need to have some sort of, um, uh, an emotional bookend for this. I, I there there was, break. it did specifically say tonight, is being played, which, you know, likely he, you know, Terrence Fletcher is, you know, he's famous in the music scene. Yeah. He's a musician's musician. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if, because it's so vital to the plot, he clearly was using the concert as an opportunity to get his revenge, to lure in Andrew and wait till that exact perfect moment to say, I knew it was you. You're the one who uh, who set this whole thing. You're the reason why I lost my job. And it, it's one of my favorite turns in the entire movie because oh, yeah. you're like, oh fuck, he's sabotaging him. This whole mm-hmm. thing is to re- he's not just sabotaging. He's not just like fucking with him to make him a better musician. He's now trying to make sure that he will not uh, that he will always be seen like this. This will ruin his reputation. It'll ruin his career by yeah. going into this concert and then sabotaging with that moment. So he sees himself as the, the guardian of jazz and yeah. you don't, you don't fit my, my template for what I think. Um, it, it's you, like, do, so do you think it was a lure or uh, do you think it was coincidence that he just walked into it? Uh, I think it was fortuitous. Yeah. I, I don't think that, I mean, if he, he would have, it would have taken a lot to get him. I mean, New York's a big place. Um, it would have taken a lot. But it also to makes sense. Get... Musicians would run in certain circles, you know, artists sure. run in certain circles, filmmakers, you know, like I know lots of the places where filmmakers in LA are hanging out, you know, right. so if, you, if you know, you just, you just run into people because you know, like this is a, this is a club, this is a restaurant, this is a bar where a lot of people go. I just feel like there would be a lot of stars that would have to align in order for, for him to make that, to conspire to do that. Yeah. Um, it's not like, you know, he was checking his email one day and going, Hey, I'm doing this. Maybe you should check it out sometime. You know what yeah, I mean? He it's was like walking by eating a corn dog. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, corn dog sounds good right now. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. So that's, that's one question I have, especially like if they're, um, like listeners in New York city, uh, or musicians in particular that are kind of familiar with that is, is it something that, uh, Fletcher could have planned, uh, or was this just, you know, or was it because one of the th- big themes about using jazz is people tend to think of jazz as like improvisational. So yeah. you're kind of like, Oh, this is a moment I'm going to take advantage of, but mm-hmm. that's not the way Fletcher approaches it. No, uh, not at all. And th- there are lots of different schools of thought in jazz from what I understand. And for him, it's everything is planned out. Everything is precise and everything is timed to get exactly the outcome. And you have to be in control of the outcome at all times. I think in the world of the story, I think in the world of the story, he is so, um, his tempo is his tempo. Like no matter what, mm-hmm. he's going to execute his um, his way of doing something. And I don't think this is the first time he's done that to somebody. Mm. Mm, you know what I that's mean? Interesting. I, yeah. He's done it for years. He's worked with cocky kids and, Oh, I'm yeah. the next, 
I'm the next Buddha of jazz. Students to suicide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the truth is he probably did that to that kid. He, I think he probably was like, you know what? Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to, you know what? Oh, wait a minute. Two weeks from now, I've got this thing going on. Mm. Hey. And uh, he was, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, okay. I think, so I you, think, so that's you think it was, you, many you, times. he wasn't setting a trap, but he saw an opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, and one of the big questions that this whole movie poses is about the question of greatness and art. Mm-hmm. And it does pose this question, would Charlie Parker have been, become bird if Joe Jones did not throw the symbol at his head? Would Charlie Parker still be the legend that he is if he didn't have that experience? What do you think? Well, I come from the belief, even in even in filmmaking, where I kind of go, well, what if E.T. didn't get into on on the UFO and go back? Mm-hmm. My whole thing is, is it kind of doesn't matter because he did. Do you know what I mean? It's like I don't know what could have been, but ultimately. He, in that moment, took that step forward. And so Charlie Parker, if he didn't, you know, if some, again, it was consistent with his MO. It was. Yeah, but what I, what I, what it's getting at is this question about like, you know, achieving greatness Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so from my own experience, for example, I've always been kind of leaned more toward autodidact. Like I, I tend to become obsessive about learning skills. Like since I was a child, I've been drawing incessantly and Mm -hmm. learning story and writing. I wrote my first novel when I was 12 years old. I mean, it's a shit novel and I'm glad no one will ever see it, but you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm leaking it right now to the internet. (laughs) Right. Um, but, but the interesting thing is, is this, this kind of implies like, the, the subtext of that is that greatness is only achieved through suffering, through kind of trauma or even kind of abuse. And what I love about this movie is it does, if you want to look at the, the allegorical dimension, you're having a battle of ideologies between Paul Reiser, the fathers, which, you know, which tradition are you going to take on? The father who says, you know what? You're good enough. You're fine. You're a good person. That's all that matters is just be kind. And then the other, the other one is kind of that, that Nietzschean Ubermensch thing that says, you're not close to your capacity. You could be so much more. And that, you know, there's that one line that says, you know, uh, true hell is on your deathbed meeting the person you could have become, mm. which is, it's a fascinating idea. And I think it's total bullshit. Yeah. It, it's, it fuels that existential angst. Um, and I get it. Like the younger me would be tortured by that. Um, but after experiences and learning more about life and the world and hopefully maturing a little bit, uh, that's a total fiction. And it's this pretense that it's pretending the idea that like you could make the perfect decisions and achieve everything and you would be so much happier than you are now which is just fiction. It's just, you know, it's, it's an ideal, but it's also like, that's not reality. That's not the world. You're most people are doing the best they can with what they have. Yeah. Um, I, my, my, again, it goes, it goes back to your understanding or your overall philosophy of life. I don't believe in fate. I believe that we're all, we're all organisms bouncing around down here trying to do our best. And, and some people are better known organisms than others. Yeah. And I, I feel like whatever decision I make is based on a previous decision that I've made before. And so I don't really, and, um, and I think that goes to the essence of my understanding of art, which is uh, art is the, um, the decisions you make and you present it to the world. I mean, that's why life is an art. Your life is your own work of art. It's mm-hmm. your own choice, the choices that you make um, that allow you to become what you are. 
I don't, um, I don't subscribe to any kind of, uh, complication like a fate or a destiny. I don't believe that there's a bigger plan in place other than, um, life is important and we must protect life. It's my highest, um, my highest, uh, uh, value. My, my, my highest virtue is, is life and the protection of life. So my thing is, is with my children, um, you know, I, I love them. I nurture them. I teach them that decisions give us choices. Uh, and some decisions don't give us choices. Mm -hmm. We end up in, in the world, but ultimately I, I believe, um, I believe that ultimately the decisions you make are going to put you in positions that you'll be able to make um, more or different decisions. Sure. But when it comes to ambition and achieving mm -hmm. greatness and achieving full potential um, in order to achieve great art, I mean, maybe we should talk about what, what makes something great art? How do you know if something is great? They said Charlie Parker, well, he said Charlie Parker did the best solo that has ever been performed which is so superlative I, and mythological that it's it's like is that you know what, what makes something great art what is great art versus just art well we start talking about criticism and again it goes back to my attitude towards criticism mm -hmm. which is that i evaluate something for what it is not what it isn't yeah and it goes back to my philosophy on life i evaluate my life for what it is, not what it isn't. It's like, oh, I'm paying rent, but I'd really like to be paying a mortgage. So I'm going to start paying a mortgage. But when, it like, come, oh. when it comes to objectives, you're dealing with what it could be. And what it could be well, yeah. implies a certain kind of ambition. And if you have this, like, Absolutely. I want to achieve this thing and it's going to take sacrifice to get there. Mm -hmm. That question of sacrifice is directly connected to achievement. But there's no, no there's no guarantees in this life. Like it doesn't matter if you do everything Michael Jackson did. It doesn't matter. You may not be the king of pop. You know you'll you know the truth is is I don't know if Charlie Parker was the greatest uh, jazz musician to have ever lived because there are so many people who have lived and so many people who have played and decided they didn't want to put it on on. Uh, on record well we can say he's the best one we know of but ultimately uh fame and greatness are two different things mm -hmm. um there are a lot of people who are famous who i don't think are all that great so do you think it was appropriate for him to have been fired uh, as an abusive person be like he said all i'm trying to do is create create greatness by basically kind of creating a, a, a fuller's fire, a, a pressure, a, a pressure cooker that forces people to transform. That's why I say he's, he's, he's the epitome of a moral imperative. Sure. And I understand that it is right for him to be fired because if he is not sustaining the values of the institution that he works for, then he needs to go find an institution that will support his values. So ultimately, again, it's a decision that he has to make. He should have left a long time ago if the institution is like, we're not down with this. We don't want kids, you know, I don't want you throwing chairs at well, drummers. Do you, think, do you think he should be allowed to teach, to mentor? I mean, until he's put in jail for killing somebody. Um, I mean, it is antisocial behavior that he's... It, yeah, he's incredibly, uh, he's, like, he's incredibly vulgar. Movie. He's insulting. He's yeah. demeaning. He, he throws objects at people. If, if a symbol hits somebody, yeah. that's going to do some damage. Yeah. You know? And, you know, and I also think he suffered from a kind of nostalgia mm. that um, idolized people who aren't around to uh, violate their sanctity. You know, well, they're not I mean, around. Look, look at the look at the military. Like when the Marines join the military, they have to go through boot camp. And the whole point of boot yep. camp is to break them down to yep. become a member of a core. They are an ingredient yep. in a big, massive tribe. Mm -hmm. and, and I've coached football. Like we, we need the Marines to be that 
so that they can function the way they do? Sure. Um, my, my question is, and even the Marines go through consultation, they go through constant change uh, of their philosophy of how to train a Marine to make them become who they are. And it, but um, it is through it is through traumas. It is through trial. It is through they are, literally have to drown and learn how to cope with drowning. Right. They have they to push their bodies to the point where their bodies are literally breaking, mm-hmm. and all for the cause of you know protecting and serving the country. And Absolutely. it is through that trauma that they can achieve things that most of us could never even dream of that we'd be capable of. Mm-hmm. And as a country, we depend on the military to be able to do that. So as, as an artist, is that not also worth it to achieve the greatness in art? That's basically what he is. Fletcher is a drill sergeant for he's a making, He's making a decision for somebody else. He's like, this is how Charlie Parker was great. So this is how I'm going to make whoever I find next as the next Charlie Parker. He's making that decision for him, and the truth is, is, is that we don't know why Charlie Parker was great, or why he had so much grit, or why he was yeah. willing to give up everything so that he could get a best-selling record or a best-selling concert. So ultimately, I don't. I believe that the way we do things is just as important as our objectives. And I believe that I don't want to live in an environment where I'm constantly feeling like I've got to watch my back. It's, you know, they, it's again, these toxic environments where, um, you know, I've worked for directors who um, steal my car and go score cocaine. It, it, it's, um, yeah. it's a, it's a nightmare life. And I, I ended up working for in a post-production house where the executive there, he was like, dude, you've got to choose what kind of life you want to live. You can't work for that guy anymore. He's, yeah. he's a nightmare. But the thing is, is he got so much work. And I was like, yeah, but I'm, I'm working a lot. Yeah. And, and he's like, dude, what are you willing to sacrifice for that work? So my, I guess my whole thing is, is, is that sure we can, uh, um, there are lots of ways to learn things. Yeah. And, and you know, I guess his pedagogy was uh, stick him in a, a boiler um, and see what we get out of him. But, you know, you can't cook everything in a boiler. Yeah. So you know? I, 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 some of my, you know, I'm an artist and I've worked yes. as an artist. And mm-hmm. so there are lots of, I understand that temptation of feeling like I want someone who is going to engage me and push me so hard that I break through and become something new. And then I I also consult on other people who are trying to achieve that. Uh And um, I take a very different tact and partially because of some of the experiences that I have. Part of it is that autodidact. Like, so for example, I I had this experience. I, I was very, I've been very lucky to go to, schools that are very difficult to get into and work with artists that are working on a very high level. And um, uh, just to protect some of the parties that are interested, I'm not going to name names, but I, I uh, did work or I, I did get to go attend a college in Paris um, as one of the schools that I attended and it was an art school. And they had this way of, so they, they set it up where they only allowed 30 students to join a year and they only allowed 29 to graduate. And that was set up in the curriculum. Now, I don't know if they still operate this way, um, but that me and then at the end of the year, they would have a portfolio review. So, or not the end of the year, the end of the entire uh, schooling system. It was a, it was a two year program. And at the end of the two-year program, all of your effort, everything you put into it, you put into a portfolio, and then the school has a panel of six professionals come in and review your portfolios. They go through and just get portfolios, no names, nothing, just the portfolio has a number, and then they rate the portfolio in order 
from one to 30. And then at the very end of the year, they have all the students at the end of that day, they have one day to review portfolios. And then all the students line up on one side of the room, all 30 of the students. And then they read out the list of how the portfolios were rated one to 30. And as it goes across, you know, they literally create this status hierarchy. They say, this is the best portfolio. Therefore the student graduates. And one by one, the ritual was brutal. Watching them cross the room and seeing the people left, the students left. Now they worked their asses off. No one there was wasting their time or screwing around. And these were very, very talented artists. And one by one, it filtered down and you knew that it came down to the last two. And the last two was whatever name was read next. The other person not only was not allowed to graduate, they couldn't put it on the resume. So it's, it's, is a really brutal program. And it, and the question I had, cause I, I spoke with the, you know, the, the administration of the school and I'm like, why would you set it up this way? How is this nurturing students? And they said, well, we're here to make students, to push students to achieve. And if they don't achieve at that level, they don't deserve the title. I'm like, what if all 30 students deserve the title? And they're like, well, they clearly don't if they can't impress. And I'm like, but you're grabbing random professionals to review a portfolio with very limited information to determine their value. And it, so basically you're saying commit to us for, for two years. And at the end of the two years, you get to find out if you spent your time wisely. And, you know, they, they defended the practice. It was, it was a very interesting thing. I, I saw it as incredibly brutal. Um, and it's not something that I respond to, but I also tend to be very much a self-driven, self-motivated type of person. Sure. Um, but I did see how many artists felt very motivated. All of a sudden, when life gets really hard, you know, this trains them to think, I got to, I have to, I have to perform. I have to do better than everybody else. But what ended up happening was every single student started seeing the others as threats. And rather than create camaraderie and networking, it created competition, but not just competition. There was sabotage. It was really interesting. And I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I also am like, I hated the experience. I hated, I felt horrible for everybody that was going through it. I especially yeah. felt horrible. The, the, when I was there, the year they did the ritual, the person that was, that did not graduate, I was shocked by like he worked so hard. He, he was actually the first person that I met in Paris. And so like seeing his whole journey, it, it was devastating. And in my opinion, looking at his portfolio, I'm like, that's not the worst portfolio, which gets into the subjectivity. So, yeah. but it's a good example of this mentality of like, well, you know, they have to be in the pressure cooker. They have to have stakes or they're not going to actually learn or perform at their best. And uh, it, it's it's interesting. I, I see the merit in it, uh, but I'm not sure. Well, it's definitely not the way I would operate. When I work with yeah. a, with clients, I try to be honest, or when I'm working a story team, especially like you know you you want to you want to work with the people you're working with, and you want to work. And I've been lucky enough to work with really talented uh, people. It's very rare you meet people who are you know trying to sabotage you. It's it's. It's just right. not a good practice. It's a great way to guarantee that you're not going to work. Um, but it's, but it, in this specific scenario, it was, I understood where they were coming from, but it, it, it echoed the whole time I was watching whiplash. It kept bringing up all this uh, French experience or the Paris experience that I had, which kind of tied into this really interesting thing that, re that I think was uh, revealed this pattern in whiplash, which is, uh, what I describe as a messiah when a messiah complex meets a martyr complex, mm. and there's this a codependency that emerged from the whole movie, where Andrew was giving Fletcher so much power, and even though the whole lesson that he had to learn was that despite my rejection, you still perform with greatness. That's what makes you great. It still is dependent on Fletcher's evaluation. Right. 
And as an artist who, you know, I am very much driven by, I am my main audience. I, uh, when I draw, when I paint, when I write, I'm mostly like, oh, this, I'm really enjoying the process. It's part of the reason why, you know, when, when most of the stuff I put out is maybe 2% of what I actually produce, uh, which has its own weaknesses and liabilities. But, sure. but I don't, I, I don't put a lot of weight on the audience, other people's opinion. If it, if it, if what I create lands with an audience and I've been lucky enough that it has landed with some audiences and it's enough to like have had a uh, built a decent career with it. Um, then that's, that's great. But I, I still am primarily focused on the artistic values that I really value. I really want to enjoy the process and I right. get a lot from it and hopefully it produces something that other people see value in. But yeah. this is a, messiah complex and a martyr complex meeting this is a messiah complex or a savior complex is is you know fletcher's like i want to be so important that i'm going to save people's lives i'm going to be the arbiter and the judge of what is greatness and then you you see uh andrew who is like i i'm going to suffer i'm going to show you i'm willing to bleed for this i'll bleed all over the place i'll get in a car accident and i'll still come play I want so both of them rather than become the myth of it is that they're becoming Charlie Parker and Joe Jones but in reality all they're doing is playing out this kind of uh, toxic codependency that's like great go have your creepy love affair over there I want to ex experience great art yeah well it, it kind of goes to my idea of this whole story, like it's interesting you'd bring up your experience in Paris because um, immediately when you start talking about um, European cinema and um, even Eastern European cinema, uh, the Polish cinema and, and the Russian cinema from uh, World War II, post-World War II, the... Uh, I have this theory that this whole story is about baby boomers who were raising the Generation X. Oh, that's interesting. Because baby boomers were raised by what we refer to as the greatest generation. And the gener greatest generation saw some of the greatest brutality of our entire um, history. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we had the Nazis. Yeah. They literally had an existential threat. Yeah. And Paris. The Nazis didn't have an existential threat. The No, the greatest generation did. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. They literally had someone who wanted to wipe out a population in yeah. order to control it. Yeah. And Paris was occupied by that horrific threat. And so when you see... Um, these baby boomers and Gen Xers um, and their relationship being raised. Gen Xers were kind of raised very differently than the kids that are being raised now. And I do not want to be the one who's like, oh, well, they're so this and that. And what I, I could care less. I'm. Yeah, it's I'm it's hard to judge a whole generation yeah, because exactly, there's so much variation. Exactly. But there are but patterns and circumstances. There are patterns. Happen. There are patterns. There's a view and there's the belief one of the great the greatest generation they clung to their religion they clung to the american religion the american mythology um george washington was a huge uh, abraham lincoln were these were these uh benchmark uh gods you know patron saints of of that mythology mm -hmm. and so um they're so often venerated i'm just waiting to to buy my george washington candle um, my Benjamin Franklin can is a little shorter than the others, but he's, he's still, but I'm bummed. Um, so he, uh, yeah, basically we have this and those are values that the greatest generation for lack of a better term, and they were raised by people who were literally scrounging. They were, they were, uh, I'm talking about in America. Um, yeah. They, they were Depression era. The Depression era raised the greatest generation, then the greatest generation 
raise the baby boomers and the baby boomers raised generation X and a little bit before there as well. Um, these are all gener it's generational trauma. That's um, moving down this line mm. that the, you know, like I remember hearing my grandmother talk about her depression era mother and how they kept everything. They never threw anything away. Like, the plastic that you use for your potato chips can go on top of your uh, Jello and keep it. You know what I mean? It's like uh, everything was this uh, almost like hoarder mentality, and then and then the greatest generation went through such a trauma because they were put. They were any any um, physically fit male uh, was put into boot camp and then sent off to uh, a war to fight in a completely different place. Um, that, that alone is traumatic, let alone what they saw on those battlefields. Mm -hmm. And then as they came home, they had to raise children. And, uh, I mean, they even adopted the military look. I mean, if you look at the clothing in, in New York and Paris, they are, um, these jackets, they're very much akin to the military garb and the, the ties and everything. It's, it's all kind of this filtering down from that generational trauma. And so the idea that, um, you know, uh, Fletcher is this baby boomer who's now trying to, uh, who has seen the previous generation and what the previous generation was capable of. And he's like, the only way we can actually achieve this is if I put you through that same Trauma, which, by the way, is the bohemian ethic, you know, the ethic that, um, oh, I have to be poor in order to create great art. Um, um, Van Gogh created great art. And Hemingway would, would um, submit himself to superhuman challenges just so that he, he felt worthy of, of, you know, writing. It was, I mean, there, there were these great writers. And then, I mean, the person that keeps coming up to me uh, because that, this is when I was introduced to jazz was in high school. Um, I learned oh, that's about right. you were a musician in high school. I, yeah, I, you know, I was in a band, I was in a punk rock band. Yeah. Um, but you did choir too. Oh yeah. I, I did all of it. I did, uh, you know, the theater and the choir and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, uh, but the, um, I was introduced in a in a an English class to Jack Kerouac and the Beat Generation, mm, yeah. and the Beat Generation was learning about um, you know jazz is the original art form of the American people, and it it came from you know a lot of the improvisational blues um, in the Deep South and the African American population there, um, and this you know Charlie Parker was one of the seminal um early jazz performers uh these uh, and and i kept seeing that uh in alan ginsburg's photographs remember alan ginsburg's photographs of the beat generation i kept seeing compositions in the film that i was just kind of like oh my gosh that is just like if, if you look at this film it is nearly timeless because it takes place in new york Yes, the, the art direction is very modern and it's here. But, I mean, it would take very little to take that. I mean, it looks like it's nearly in CinemaScope. It's just that vibrant color. So the candy-like beautiful primary colors, but also um, the intricate green compositions. These are all um, like a hailing back to that time, the jazz, the post-jazz era um hmm. i don't know i i don't me, know musical like, eras very well well you know it's i mean thelonious monk and charlie parker mm -hmm. and all these um i mean even dizzy gillespie who's he's later you know he's much younger but um you know and i am not like a jazz aficionado i just know a lot of the stuff because i was a huge jack kerouac fan yeah and a William Burroughs fan. Yeah, and you got me into Jack Kerouac. 
Well, yeah, I mean, and, you know, all of my friends were reading it because they're like, yeah, man, this is, this is cool. Yeah. But, I you know, it, like. yeah. And, and I don't know. I just on the road was a very, very important piece of literature for me. Yeah. It still is. So, so tying this into whiplash, are you saying that, I mean, I, I do see this as an argument about kind of, uh, I hate this term, but kind of like this idea idea of patriarchy the idea of like what are the uh, like paternal values that are is it making a case for like you know paul riser the gentle more nurturing Mm -hmm. supportive father figure versus the you're not good enough until you defy me kind of i suggest to you that um that it is all needed. It is all, I think it's interesting that. Are you saying the movie is, say, is, is making a case that it's all needed or you're, you're all, saying yeah. personally that you I mean, Paul Reiser, I don't think that for a second, cause they didn't make Paul Reiser the bad guy, even though he was full of doubt and concern for his child. Yeah, his child yeah. loved him dearly. They spent time together. He had major influence on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the other character who has a, a Fletcher who has an, a massive huge um, uh, influence on Andrew's outcome. I would suggest to you that it's, it's all of the things that came together, but ultimately it was his choice. Mm-hmm. He had to choose to kind of go, yeah, I could choose comfort, but in order, in order for me to also, but I could, he didn't have to leave his dad. His dad was still there. He didn't go anywhere, but he had to strike out on his own. Literally, you saw it visually. It was almost kind of a um, uh, Kurosawa-like positioning of the characters, Mm. like relationship-wise. They were he was he was going towards his father for comfort, and they gave him enough comfort that he's like, "No, damn it, I gotta go fix this," you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was. It it almost had that kind of uh, feeling of visual you know the visual story is very strong that was one of the things i absolutely loved about this show was how how um it really did tell most of the story visually if you turn off the sound and god forbid you turn off the sound because the music in this is is just so incredibly beautiful Mm -hmm. um and i loved you know, someone I, I heard somebody say, well, this is a really great example of how uh, um, there's no character arc in this, but it's still a successful story. It's like, are you kidding me? There's no character. Arc? First of all, stop pretending like, you know, what you're talking about with character arc. Oh, we're um, all figuring it out. We're all. F- I, I understand I that. But if you're going to make a statement like that as an instructor, you might want to reevaluate. What's yourself. their name? Where do they live? Let's oh, go well, teach them a lesson. What? No, I mean, we're all figuring it out. And, it, you know, and even if it didn't have a character arc, it's still compelling. I do think it yeah. has a character arc. It has a very clear character arc that I is the product of the, the, the plot structure. But. Yeah, I, I, I do as well. I don't believe you have to have a character arc, but, um, I mean, do, you, do they need to be strawberry shortcake and now all of a sudden they're He-Man? No, that's the, the, you don't have to have a character arc that – that uh, well illustrated or obvious, but ultimately, yeah, I do think I mean, this I don't is want a, to criticize this, other people's. Yeah, critique. but this this is a movie that really clearly shows a very very strong belief, a strong va- moral value system that is dependent on conflict. It goes through that that ritual, the ordeal. And then transforms. And we see that transformation when he yeah. says, no, I'm going back and I'm going to take over the show. I'm going to start leading. I'm going to fight him. And yep. it's it's that moment where he takes control of the band that you're like, oh, th- he has a new strategy. He has a new value system. And the value system is I'm not going to pre- I'm not going to give Fletcher the power anymore. Fletcher has to follow me. Yep. Which is a very clear transformational value system. Or transformation mm-hmm. of his value system. So, yeah, I, would, I definitely would argue this is it, it has an arc, and it's you know, 
I also don't want to like deify like arcs like they're, they're no no I one yeah. element of it. Um, yeah it yeah I I love this movie like as an artist I understand the temptation like that feeling of like I want a mentor that believes in me so much that sees the greatness that I question in myself and have that clear like this is what's going to make you great and 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 have it push you. And it's, it's interesting. I I've seen, I've seen artists that have that kind of mentality, both dismally fail and succeed. And then I've also seen other artists who are just really nice people. They're pretty good at what they do and they're crazy successful. So a a lot, I mean, I believe a lot of it comes down to work ethic. Most of it comes down to work ethic, but it also, you know, playing politics getting along with people, all of those things factor into success. But this question is, it doesn't, success is as defined by Fletcher and as defined by uh, Andrew, success is making that great art. You know, fuck politics, fuck networking, fuck all of that stuff. They just care about making that great, perfect moment of art. Mm -hmm. Which And I think there's a... I, I guess it comes down to, you know, what kind of artist do you want to be? Do you want to be Charles Perkowski or do you want to be like Michael Shabon? You know what I mean? It's like Michael Shabon like the most kind of, I know I love them both too. Mm-hmm. And Perkowski has a, such an amazing style to him yeah. and his prose is so incredible that you just, I, I'm just saying that ultimately they both deliver really powerful things Yeah, and they're both very well noted in their industry. Um, but you know, I think I'd rather have lunch with Mike, and and uh, maybe just see the documentary of of Bukowski. I just that's oh, just, I'd love to hang with both of them. I'd love really that. you want to hang love out a drink with Bukowski. Oh, amazing. maybe yeah. okay, okay. I'm not turning down drinks with my uh, with with Bukowski. Okay, yeah. so I mean, my thing, I guess, is um, ultimately, what kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to feed? that or do do you you want to make great art ultimately the the reality is is that uh some great art just is never seen yeah that's true and so it it was interesting my time in italy for example i I spent some time Mm -hmm. in italy in florence and in florence there is this like there is this mentality and that the whole idea of like michelangelo represents the height of what can be achieved and according to a lot of schools and theories and the artists that I mixed with and, and teachers that I mixed with took an attitude of like, there is no artist achieves the level that Michelangelo has achieved and anyone to compare themselves to Michelangelo, it, 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 even if they put themselves on the same level as blasphemy. And I think that's silly. Well, I don't think it's silly. It comes with a great deal of historical appreciation but I believe, I think every generation probably has a thousand Michelangelo's. I think like, yeah. for example, working in, working like in Los Angeles, in Burbank, uh, it is uh, probably several thousand of Michelangelo's. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, like Michelangelo is a very unique artist in a very unique position at a very unique time. But um, but I think I, but I think the genius is just more f- flourishes a lot more than people can appreciate. It's just a question of Michelangelo is the combination of politics, power, money, and an artist that was recognized by the Medici at, at, at exactly the right time, yeah. the Pope at exactly the right time. But then again, look at Michelangelo. He he fucking had the battle. He was a sculptor. And largely due to fucking Raphael, the fucking hack that he is. Yeah, I'm calling Raphael <laughs> hack. I'm doing it. I don't care. Do he's it. not a great. He's he's way celebrated as one of the great fathers of the um, uh, of the Renaissance. And I, look at his. Just do a close up. Zoom in to Raphael's portraits, uh, especially like School of Athens. Perfect example. Compare School of Athens with the Sistine Chapel which was being painted at the exact same time. And Raphael literally had to sneak into the Sistine Chapel and stole sketches in order to try and 
compete with Michelangelo because Michelangelo was a force of nature. He was a sculptor and he was just, he felt called by God. He, he genuinely believed he was God's gift to art. <laughs> and he was trained as a sculptor and the Pope said, well, I'll let you do murals. And he's like, I don't know how to paint. He goes, well, you better learn because that's your job. That's your commission. And so it's like, and he ended up changing art forever by painting the Sistine Chapel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was intended as Raphael trying to sabotage him. Um, and it didn't. It ended up creating greatness. And he just went on to make some of the most beautiful art ever. And because of that, I get that that's what ma makes Michelangelo so great. And Raphael pretty much just a, a hacky uh, like wannabe of Da Vinci. Um, I think he's way over celebrated, but Raphael was better at politics. You know, he went to the right parties. He went to the right orgies. He, you know, uh, did drugs with the right powerful people, that kind of shit. Uh, sure. But Michelangelo was, I don't care about any of that shit. I care about art. I don't care about politics. I don't care about pleasing anybody. I'm here to make great art. And he was so difficult to be with. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of its own character and archetype, but it, it's also part of what sabotaged him and undermined him. Like, it, you know, if he had, if he could create anything he wanted, you know, that goes back to the argument. If he was free to do whatever he wanted and he didn't have to worry about the politics or pleasing the right people in power, would he have created something even better? He definitely wouldn't have done the Sistine Chapel when the Sistine Chapel changed the way we look at figure painting and anatomy. It, it it was it is genuinely work of a timeless genius. At the same time, I think we're constantly generating this. I think humanity is full of genius that is largely untapped, and that you know that goes into to questions of social issues and privilege and opportunities and uh, things like that. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, all of those things kind of like drummed up from from watching Whiplash. I, I loved it. I waited a long time to watch it and I'm, I'm kind of glad I waited a long time to watch it. I think the, the movie is a simple movie about very big, very complex ideas. And it beautifully articulates that question of, you know, the martyr complex meets a Messiah complex. And it's, it's fascinating. Do you have any other thoughts that you want to share about whiplash? Well, I, I mean, there are several illustrations for me as far as within the story talking about generational trauma. Oh, and yeah. that's why I got so excited about the dinner scene mm -hmm. because then yeah. you, 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 you're able to kind of triangulate where um, your character gets some of his Achilles heel and some of his. I'm sorry. Did I truncate where you were going with that whole intergenerational allegory? Like, did, I don't know. I don't did remember. you want to kind of delve deeper into that? Cause that, it is a really, I hadn't thought about that. The idea that yeah. like it, it represents the generational value shift where now like in schools and stuff, you know, he would be like Fletcher would be canceled. Yeah. Uh, he, he essentially was canceled, um, yeah. except he's still, you know, he's still directing uh, ensembles and stuff. But sure. um, but, you know, there's this kind of attitude with uh, with academia, which is very much like, oh, you you ha you can't upset. The students, you you have to very carefully, gently nurse them through their exploration. Well, and this kind of this brings into question, like, well, yeah, but you, are they going to be able to produce? They, they'll, you know, you'll get them through your system, but are they going to be able to produce the work that we need as a culture? Is, is it going to come from an academia that is so gentle and so careful and so terrified of lawsuits? See, it's my, I have a lot of theory on pedagogy and um, specifically um, the, like, for instance, when he uses tools of indoctrination. Yeah, he um, does. Yep. That's a great point. That's a and really he was, point. you know, he's like, say it. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. Long to be, there's a reason you're here, right? Say yep. it. Say it. Your reason you're here. Yeah. Put my words in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. Put my words in your mouth. No, it's not my tempo. Here's my tempo. Yep. Two, three, four. 
That's yeah. not my tempo. That's not my. So it was constant. There was this and that mind game of like one of you, yeah, either you know and you're afraid to say it, or you don't know, which is even worse. Yeah, that's it's great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he, um, and so there, there's a lot of that kind of indoctrination issues. See, um, I have this belief that um, great films use. Um, are rhetoric, but they are, they are, uh, used in persuasion. Um, and everything that you do within the film is a persuasive argument. Mm -hmm. For instance, Star Wars is a really good example, just because, um, we have massive contrast, uh, between, you know, the empire and the rebellion. We have a very organic art direction. We have a costuming that's very organic in the rebellion. We have um, things that feel like they came from World War II, which at the time was still old, was antique by the time that movie was made in the, in the late 70s. Yeah. So one of the things that, and a lot of what the, the technology was, uh, you know, you have the Millennium Falcon who, that felt like this clunky old tugboat compared to the, you know, the Corvettes that the stormtroopers were flying around in. <laughs> so, you know, you have these, um, again, those are persuasive arguments to, to create contrast. Um, and ultimately in, in teaching and in film, we're the same thing. I mean, I believe that a filmmaker has to have something to say or don't make a movie. I like, I understand. I love shooting things and cutting them together and it's fun, but if you don't have anything to say, then you're wasting a lot of people's time. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I, okay. I think, I think the hardest thing you can do as a filmmaker and a storyteller is keep people interested in what's going to happen next. And I think that art form of entertainment is Unfortunately, too many people say, well, at least it's entertaining. And I'm like, do you realize how difficult it is to be entertaining? Well, ultimately, that I think it's actually easier to get academic. It's easier to get allegory and metaphors and symbols. I think making something dramatic and engaging is really hard to do. And that's what this movie does really Again, that well. Is that goes into your prose, your, your yeah. rhetoric. Yep, exactly. And th again, it's all, again, you have to have something to say. You have to have something to teach in order to make an argument for your audience. Your audience is constantly trying to decide whether or not they will believe you. And ultimately, mm -hmm. when you rhetorically um, give them an argument to believe you, for instance, this is a really great example. Um, now, I'm not a helicopter pilot. I, I know that everyone's shocked by that, but I'm not a helicopter pilot. However, there was a movie I was watching where uh, Dwayne Johnson, who I love, by the way, uh, Dwayne, anytime you're, you're ready, I have several pitches for you. Um, but he was flying a helicopter and uh, he had to jump out of the helicopter and get back into the helicopter. And he had to like, I think he had to dive into some chasm or something from a tether in the helicopter. So um, he's, you know, he's flying this thing and then he's like, I'm going to hit the hover button, you know, the, uh, button. the hover button. And it was literally, it was a red button on the dash and right underneath it said hover. What movie is this? Uh, what was it called? It was the one where Los Angeles was earthquaking and. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alexander. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And he hit the hover button. And I was just kind of like, I don't know if that's real or not, but that's just <laughs> the dumbest looking thing I've ever seen. Rhetorically, it was weak, is what I'm saying. Okay. Is it didn't like it my brain. disengaged you. You're like, no, that's yeah, my brain is no kind hover of like, button in a what? Huh. I don't know. You know, it's like, uh I mean, even if you did I mean, cover it up a little or layer it somehow so that I feel like I'm not being stupid by following exactly what you're saying. <laughs> you know, and now like, that it did take you out of the story. You're like, wait, do helicopters have story, hover yeah. buttons when the whole time you should be like, uh, are they going to get it? You know, is are they going to achieve their goal? Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Are they going to achieve their goal? Yeah. And, and so it was all like rhetorically, um, the, the prose wasn't placed correctly. And so I felt like, again, um, when I'm, when my critical thinking is up and, and during these movies, I mean, they're a lot of fun and yes, they are entertaining and they are saying something, but that, and that's my thing is I, I'm not asking for you, um, to, uh, give me Das Boot. I just want, I want you to say something to me, um, that I'm either going to believe or that I'm going to want to believe, you know, I want to go with you with your argument. And it's one of the reasons why I believe very strongly that people have really strong beginnings to stories. It's, it just happens all the time. They have this great premise, this idea, but ultimately because they don't prepare the argument well by the third act, it completely falls apart. And, and so why, uh, and, and this whole story of Whiplash, for instance, they didn't go out on a limb with a whole lot of anything really, except for the fact that, um, you know, they had a real life Godzilla in a, in a practice room in New York. Yeah. I mean, he, he was an absolute monster. Um, and I think if they did go out on a limb, it was probably with him and his character. Um, but they got an absolutely brilliant actor to do it. And so you believed yeah. it. Uh, again, that was the rhetoric that they used. That was the argument that they used to, to make you believe something absolutely horrific. You know, I mean, I can't imagine if, uh, I can't think of an actor right now that would have probably, oh, well, if Joe Pesci were to play that part. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I think J.K. Simmons, God, he was iconic. Like, he was right. amazing. He was compelling. Really? And I totally believed that character believed everything. Like, Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Again. You, you know what movie kept coming to mind when I was watching it? What's that? The Chocolate War. Oh, I know you love this movie. Yeah, I know it, it's movie. it's one of my favorite movies. I love it. It's this obscure indie '80s movie about a Catholic boys' school, and it's all about it's it's based on this uh, novel that was adapted yeah. in the film, and it has an amazing soundtrack. Peter Gabriel, Kate Bush. It, it's such yes, an '80s right? synth. It's so good. Uh, but so the good. the heads. Um, Headmaster? The headmaster. What it, I don't know what his title would be, but he's basically the, oh, he's, he's the principal of the school that runs the Catholic boys school. Yeah. And it's an amazing performance about this really fucked up spiritual religious leader. And he's sitting there trying to corrupt all the boys uh, to force them into conformity. And it's one of my favorite stories about integrity in the face of compliance and, you know, personal values uh, and how they conflict with conformity. It's so, so good. And I do wonder if like Damien Chazelle had that, like had seen the movie and had a seed of that inspiration. Cause the way they introduced that character of uh, the headmaster, he, he play he's constantly playing mind games with everybody and they're constantly, it's designed to keep everybody on their toes. It's, it's classic narcissism where it's, you know, I, I don't want you to define me, so I'm going to make sure you never have a clear sense of where you stand with me. Really interesting. Well, let's wrap this up. I, that was a really yeah. good conversation. And I really, really was impressed with this movie. I um, I still haven't seen La La Land. Um, I, I, full what? disclosure, I'm not huge on musicals. I absolutely love oh. Moulin Rouge and you know some yeah. of the classics. But I, uh, so La La Land w wasn't something that grabbed me. And I, it, it was also one of those things where it got a lot of hype and I was kind of like, oh, I'll get to it later. So I wasn't really familiar with a lot of his stuff, but, you know, 10 Cloverfield Lane, I, I really enjoyed. But, what are you talking um, about? La La Land? What, where is that coming from? Oh, Damien Chazelle also did La La Land. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I'm just not, that. I'm not immersed in his work very much. But then when I watched Whiplash, I was like, holy shit, this is brilliant. It's so yeah. good all about art it's all about the art and the struggle and everything so i am excited to jump into la la land to, after this to see like what else he has to say and how he explores it so um cool um so anyways let's let's wrap this up um todd you want to remind uh, the audience where they can uh, get in touch with you yeah i'm on all the things you know instagrams and the facebooks and uh i don't think i have a facebook 
uh, page anymore. I just, uh, just my regular old self. Um, but I wanted to remind, you know what? I'm going to, um, the 50th commenter in YouTube will get a Todd is funny.com st- <laughs> vinyl sticker, a high quality. That's so uh, cool. Yeah. And it's, it, I haven't put it, I haven't put the gray hair in there yet. Cause I, <laughs> I'm not ready to accept it. Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's okay. You can dye it. I dye my beard. Do you? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. That's good. It looks good, actually. I'm, I need to find the guy that keeps you, growing there for you. <laughs> Great, awesome. Yeah, definitely check out ToddIsFunny.com. Todd is funny. That should be is in all caps. Um, and also be sure to go to Cinematicore.com where you can get Story by Numbers, uh, the book where we uh, it goes into all of the plot points, the entire structure. And it's a really deep dive. Everything that we're talking about is really just applying all the principles that Story by Numbers talks about. Um, also available is the, the workbook that goes along with it. And the workbook is just, if you have a story that you're developing, it's kind of a way of taking notes and organizing the, the development process before you go to script. And it's, it's, it's something that I would use when I work with clients. I recommend they get the workbook and then we can go through the workbook uh, as a way of developing whatever idea you have. Um, and then also, uh, if you've got an idea you're developing or you got a script, uh, sign up for my wait list to, uh, to get some consult time with me personally. Um, and that's all at cinematicore.com. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Todd. That was a great conversation. Uh, it really made me think about some really interesting stuff. Uh, and uh, tune in for next week and have a great week. You've got a story inside you, a screenplay no one has ever thought of, a novel you've been rolling around inside your coconut for years. Maybe you wrote a few pages and stalled out. Maybe you even wrote a whole draft but don't feel confident it's any good. Or maybe you've been writing draft after draft after draft and slamming into writer's blocks or dead ends or wandering into the weeds. Maybe you just have a few scenes centered around some dope high concept, but you don't know how to develop a character, much less construct a plot that would generate a character arc. Maybe all you have is some simmering spark of an idea. Just a simple desire to write a story this book is for you story by numbers is a step-by-step process it gives you the tools to construct a plot that fleshes out your story with characters so real so compelling so multi-dimensional you begin to wonder if you're possessed story by numbers is composed of three parts Part 1 gives you an overview of the 4-act structure, 24 plot points, 8 sequences. Part 2 is a 35-question examination of your story that will guide you through developing and outlining your novel or screenplay into the 4-act template. Part 3, well, that's just next-level dope shit. This isn't just another book on theory. Story by Numbers is a diagnostic toolkit for developing and fine-tuning your story. You'll also want to pick up the Story by Numbers workbook. For each story you're writing, you'll need a journal to organize your ideas. The Story by Numbers workbook is a companion notebook that walks you through the process as you outline your story and guide you through each phase of development. From constructing your protagonist's internal drive, to plotting conflicts that expose character, to composing scenes that drive compelling stories. By the time you've completed your Story by Numbers workbook, you'll be ready to finish your manuscript. Whenever you ask a writer what it takes to write a good story, they usually say there are no rules. If you want to know what they really think, ask them about a novel or movie they hate. Immediately they'll unload a litany of do's and don'ts so specific, so precise you'd think they're citing commandments. We all know following a formula is what turns stories into zombified, hacky imitations of better stories. You don't want a formula. You want a process. A method composed of practical principles that breathe life into your concept. You don't want some bullshit magical key. You just want to know what works and what doesn't. Does your story resonate or not? Everyone knows there are no rules for writing a great story. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, here are the rules. Story by numbers. Write more, better, faster, doper. <laughs>